So today we're going to continue our series, The Thrill of Hope. The Thrill of Hope. And we kicked it off last week with a message titled, Hope Gives Us a Voice. Hope gives us a voice. And the voice that hope gives us is because the hope we, can, we have in Christ Jesus, the hope that we have in God our Father who has been faithful through the ages, we can speak, we can use our voice, and we can speak boldly and confidently telling others about the good news of Jesus Christ. And I hope if you missed that message, you'll go back to our website, woodlands.cc, where you can watch it uh, on demand there, or you can download it, take it with you. This is uh, part two of the series, and this message is called Hope Gives Us a Voice. I'm sorry, Hope Gives Us Purpose. Hope Gives Us Purpose. So our uh, scripture passage for today from Romans chapter 5, I invite you to open up your Bible, uh, turn there with me. We're going to look at Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, and we're going to be going uh, through that word by word, verse by verse. So uh, get out your pen, get out your pencil, uh, get out a notebook, uh, maybe open up your notes on your phone uh, where you can uh, uh, be typing with your thumbs and uh, take some good notes today because we've got a lot of good stuff to share with you that will be a super encouragement to you and your family, your friends, your loved ones uh, throughout this Christmas season. So Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Let's just read it all together in context. Uh, um, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, and let me just mention that Romans is a letter that was written by a man named Paul. He's often called the Apostle Paul. All right, and Paul... Um, he wrote a number of the letters that are included in the New Testament. This one he wrote to Christian people, to people in a church in Rome. And it was a center of religion, a center of uh, Roman activity. And so as he wrote to them, uh, Romans is considered um, sort of uh, the, uh, the magnum opus, if you will, of Paul's, uh, uh, Paul's work. Certainly one of the most brilliant men to ever live. Um, as has been cited in the book of lists over the, the years and years. Um, Paul writes here to these Christians in Roman in Romans, and we're gonna pick and we're gonna just kind of focus on this one chapter for now, uh, Romans chapter five. Uh, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now you should underline or highlight that phrase, justified by faith. Through him, uh, so he's talking about Jesus, through Jesus, we have also obtained access. I want to underline that word access. By faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope. Okay, there's our, there's our theme for this series, right? The thrill of hope. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Verse 3. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And we can be sure that hope does not disappoint us. Hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This is God's Word. So let's go back to that phrase that it opens up with, um, this phrase, justified by faith. It, uh, this is Paul's nutshell summary of the gospel. Just to summarize the gospel, um, he, 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 we are justified by faith. That's how Paul says it. And uh, the gospel, again, just to be clear, the gospel is uh, uh, the, the, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The gospel literally means good news, and we talk about that in Christian circles. What we're talking about is Jesus who came to earth here uh, during the Christmas season. That's what we celebrate. That's why Christmas exists, to have, because Jesus came to earth. He was born by the Virgin Mary. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He died on the cross. He suffered there. And then he was raised from the dead. That is the good news. And Paul summarizes it with this phrase, justification by faith. Uh, Professor Dr. Scott McKnight, a well-known uh, theologian in America today, he writes this. He says, quote, since the Reformation, and the Reformation uh, was in the 1500s, early 1500s, 
no doctrine, and our doctrine, of course, is what we believe, our dogma, what we stand on, has had more importance in the church than this one. Okay, no doctrine more important than justification by faith. The Protestant Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, which was absolutely revolutionary in the history of Christianity, it was spearheaded by a man named Martin Luther. And uh, Martin Luther, when he rediscovered, if you will, he rediscovered these words of Paul's doctrine of justification by faith alone. You see, the church... As it grew into the Middle Ages, uh, from uh, you know from 800, 900, 1,000, 1,100, 1,200, 1,300, all all these through these centuries, the church had become very very corrupt, uh, the Roman Catholic Church uh, per se. And Martin Luther was just a simple Catholic priest, but as he was reading Romans, he was absolutely struck by the fact that what the Catholic Church was teaching and especially how they were behaving had nothing to do with Jesus, had nothing to do with what Jesus had taught his disciples and with the message that was to be shared to all the people to bring them hope and good news. And so uh, uh, Dr. McKnight, he goes on, he says this, he says, to Luther, uh, this this doctrine of justification by faith, he calls it a fundamental counterthrust to medieval Catholicism, which, uh, with its theology of works and indulgences. Because the people were being taught, basically, they had to be good enough to get into heaven, and they had to pay, literally pay money, uh, or do these indulgences, you know, or, or do so many acts uh, that the church, the Roman Catholic Church of that day was uh, saying that they should do. And the church was getting rich and rich and rich, and the poor uh, were not being cared for. And so the, the act of justification by faith, Martin Luther, he absolutely turned the, 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 the tale of religious history here during this time. You see, the word justification, it's actually a legal term. So if you uh, think, for example, uh, you know, always, you know, big words, it's always good to break them down to their root words, right? So the root word of justification is what? Justice, right? It's justice. So that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about getting justice, okay? And so what he's saying is that our justice doesn't come by anything that we do. It comes by faith. And so it provides a different perspective on salvation in Christ. Now, what is the opposite of justice? Well, the opposite of justice is condemned. If you're not justified, then you're condemned. Justification means that in Christ, though we are sinners, we are not condemned. Though we're sinners, we're not condemned. Uh, it's, it's difficult sometimes to understand this, but let me give you the best example I could think of. Um, because when we're justified, that does not mean we're declared not guilty, okay? No, we're still guilty, all right? All of us are sinful people, and we are saved only by the, the, the grace of God in Jesus Christ, okay? So then, how are we justified if we're guilty? Well, you may want to think of it this way. Uh, in our Constitution in the United States, it reads that the president shall have power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States. So, we are granted a reprieve, if you will. I think that's one of the best uh, common day ways to look at this idea of justification by faith. Uh, my wife, Ruth, and I, we uh, really enjoy watching this uh, show uh, called Poldark. And it takes place in uh, the late 1700s in England. And uh, this man named Poldark, um, he's really uh, a, a people's champion. He was born and bred in a, uh, you know, kind of an upper crust family. But yet, unlike the rest of the upper crust people of the day, he lives with the people, he cares for the people, and he fights for the people. And, and so uh, there was one scene recently where three young men were taken to trial uh, for murder. And in those days, you were still hung, you know, by the gallows uh, if you were found guilty and given the death penalty. One guy was actually guilty of the murder, although he didn't really mean to murder the guy. They were 
fighting and the guy ended up dying. The other two, though they were innocent, when they were brought before trial, they were actually convicted uh, because of the um, because of the witnesses who basically lied. Okay, they basically lied and said that they were in on it as well. Uh, but at the very last moment, when uh, these three young men were on the chairs, the noose is around their neck, Ross Poldark stands up and he gives an inspiring speech. And, and he uses the very words that we use in our Constitution. He says, reprieve, reprieve. And all the people start chanting together, reprieve, reprieve. And the man who had the power to do this, finally, right at the very last moment, the 11th hour, he stands up and he goes, we grant a reprieve to two of the young men. They were brothers who were indeed completely innocent of the crime. And, and so that, in, in many ways, um, in that case, they were completely innocent, but in the court of law, they'd been convicted, all right? And they were guilty in the sense they shouldn't have been there in the first place where all this rubble, r r rabble rouse and took place. In a very real sense for us, even though we're still convicted, even though we're still guilty, we are given a reprieve. And that reprieve from God, okay, that pardon is, is what justification by faith is. We are justified by faith in Jesus Christ in all that he has done for us. You see, God accepts us in spite of our sin. We're not accepted by God because somehow we become righteous, but rather we become righteous because God has accepted us. So look again at verse 1. It says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith. So having explained just being justified by faith more thoroughly, uh, Paul has explained this more thoroughly beginning in chapter 3, verse 21. He goes on through all of chapter 4. So if you want to get some background on this, read chapter 3, starting verse 21, through all of chapter 4 uh, for some background on this uh, justification by faith. Verse 1 begins, therefore. And whenever you see therefore in Scripture, you want to try to figure out what it's there for. All right? And so it's there because... He is, he, Paul is saying, in light of what I've just said in all of chapter 4 and the end of chapter 3, okay, uh, he, he, he said he, he now wants to show the benefits of being justified. And that's what we're going to dig into today. So we're going to look at four benefits of being justified by faith. Number one, justification gives us peace with God. Verse 1, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, before we became Christians and are adopted into God's family, the Bible literally refers to us as enemies of God. If you are not a Christian, if you do not um, consider yourself one who has surrendered to the loving grace of Jesus Christ and surrendered, then, then you are literally in a state of being an enemy of God. Um, this is actually later in this chapter, chapter 5, verse 10, it says, if while we were enemies, so here we see it right in this chapter, if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. So Paul uses that language. As enemies, we were subject to to or in danger of divine wrath, the wrath of God. And we see the word wrath used in verse 9 of this chapter, chapter Romans 5, 9. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much, and that's a reference to the cross, the blood Jesus shed on the cross, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. So before we come to know Christ, we are his enemies, and we are subject to, we are in danger of, we are destined to feel his wrath, and that's why we want everyone to be saved. That's why we want everyone to know Jesus. That's why we want everyone to be justified by faith. We don't want anyone to be an enemy of God, and God doesn't want you to be his enemy either. We are his enemies because, <coughs> because of um, our sin. And he's given us a way to be forgiven for that. So to understand why we need peace with God, why before our salvation in Christ, we were his enemies and subject to his wrath, 
to really get a grasp of that, we need to understand something of the holiness of God. The holiness of God. Write that down if you're taking notes. The very word holy, the word that we translate from the Greek language, which is what the New Testament was originally written in, it means separate, to be separate from anything and everything else. It means to be in a category of his own. So God is holy. God is separate. God is in a category of his own. The Bible tells us very simply, straightforward, there is no one else like God, right? Jesus, God in a bod. He lived a perfect life with no sin, no sin. So Jesus represented that holiness of God in his earthly life. Now, Adam, <coughs> excuse me. Let me snag a quick drink of water here. Um, Adam, he was the first human who was made by God, with, and he was made with no sin. So Adam was created first. His name means beginning or first in the Garden of Eden by God, and Adam had no sin. But even though he was in perfect paradise, he still rebelled against God and sin. And so here's the thing. Sin and holiness cannot share the same space. It's just absolutely impossible. It is a, it, 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 it is a scientific impossibility to have holiness and sinfulness share the same space. So that leads to a problem. Now, the best illustration I could think of to help us get a little bit of a grasp of this and to see the logic behind it is <coughs> look at this picture and think about a lab, a laboratory that is a clean room, okay? In a clean room, uh, they have basically sucked out all of the germs in the room. The, the, the people that go into it, they have to be sterilized. They have these hazmat suits on. And you can see here um, this, uh, this, this woman... Um, uh, you know, she literally has you know, a sealed mask with oxygen being fed in because there can be no germs allowed in this, in this clean room. If it does, it contaminates all the work that's been done in there. And so, see, that gives us a little bit of an idea on an earthly level of why holiness cannot have sin in its presence. There can be no germs in a clean room. There can be no sin in the presence of holiness. And therein lies the problem, all right? Hang with me here, okay? Hang with me. God loves every one of us with an unconditional and everlasting love. And that's just the plain fact. He loves you so much. He would give anything for you. He wasn't content to leave us in our sin and to simply let us die separated from him forever. So Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the triune God, took on flesh and bone, which is what we celebrate here at Christmas. He lived the life that we couldn't live, and then he died the death that we should have died. And on the cross, he cried out. On the cross, Jesus, beaten, bloodied, bruised, exhausted, um, bleeding so profusely with the breath that he could muster, literally pushing himself up on the nails that were <coughs> driven through his feet. He cried out to God, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was the darkest moment in all of human history. Because at that moment, on the cross, Jesus, the Holy One, took on all the sin of the world. He took on all of your sin. He took on all of my sin. He took on all the sin that had ever been committed and all the sin that ever would be committed. The Holy One became unholy, and the Father turned His face away from the Son. 
Jesus bore the wrath of God so that we would not face his wrath. Jesus became an enemy of God so that we would not be his enemies. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that if you believe in him, you will not die, but you will have everlasting life. And if you believe that, if you're watching this and you believe that, I have good news for you. You've been justified. You've been justified in your faith. Now, the first benefit of that justification is that we are now at peace with God. The wrath has been satisfied. We're no longer enemies, but we are at peace with him and always will be from here through eternity because of what Jesus did. So as we look at these four benefits of being justified by faith, number one was uh, that justification gives us peace with God. And number two is that uh, it gives us access to God. Number two, it gives us access to God. The access, like justification, it says, is obtained through faith. Now, what's the big deal about this access? Why don't you think about this? The word we translate access can also mean approach or an introduction. Okay, so by giving access, that means you are allowed to approach. That means that someone gives you an introduction, okay? So now think about, for example, if you will, uh, th think about being invited to a party, to a grand ball, to a grand banquet, right? Um, and everybody that you ever wanted to meet is there. Uh, there is one person that you have wished to meet your entire life. And that person is there at this party or at this ball. And there's a bunch of people crowded around that person because even other famous people have wanted to meet this one person. So, so, uh, so many want to meet this person that they can do little more than shake his hand, right? You get to shake his hand and, 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 and he gets a smile and, and then you move on. And that's how it is for so many. And as you stand in line, though, <coughs> excuse me. I apologize. Got a real tickle in my throat this morning. Um, as you stand there in line, as you stand there in line, um, uh, yeah, this, uh, this young teenage girl comes up to you. And, uh, you know, she, she walks by. She notices you standing there. And, and for some reason, she stops and she begins talking with you. And she is an absolutely delightful young girl. She's, uh, she's mature beyond her age. And unlike most of the people who are there at this grand ball, this party, um, she is not interested in herself, but rather um, she is, is more interested in you. She doesn't want to spend her time telling you all that she's done. She wants to spend her time telling, uh, finding out about you and who you are and, and what you've done. She knows you're not famous. She knows that you don't really fit in here with so many of the other people. But for whatever reason, she has taken a real liking to you. And, 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 so, uh, at time, uh, and so as you sat and talked, time has passed by. Time is starting to get away. And uh, the line is still so long. A and you mention, you mention um, that it looks like you're not going to get the chance to meet this most famous person whom you've always wanted to meet. Um, and at that moment, though, this, uh, this delightful little teenager who has made you feel good about, uh, about you, uh, about just being there, about who you are, and, and she, she uh, reaches out, she takes you by the arm, right, and she says, why don't you come with me? And a, a little worried about losing your place in line, just in case you, you would make it up there, you decide to go ahead and go with the young girl who seems so confident. And she passes with you in her arm, famous person after famous person after famous person. She walks right up to the front of the line. At the front of the line, she cuts right in front of the person who is standing there. And, 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 and she introduces you to this most famous person whom you have wanted to meet your entire life. Now, this most famous person suddenly stops, recognizes the young teenage girl, 
smiles at her, looks at you, and locks his eyes on you. And in that moment, you feel like you are the only person on earth. And he looks at you and he smiles at you. And the effervescent young teenager introduces you, announcing your name and saying, I'd like you to meet my daddy. You see, being justified by faith through the saving work of Jesus grants us access to the Father. Jesus introduces you to God Almighty, creator of the universe, the great I am, the one who was in the beginning and will be forevermore. Jesus introduces you to him. And because Jesus introduces you to him, you have access to him. And he locks his eyes on you. And he listens to every word you have to say. And he loves you like he loves his son. And he will always be ready to give you his full and undivided attention every time you call on his name. That's access. Number three, the benefit of being justified by faith is it gives us joy in suffering. It gives us joy in suffering. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, Paul writes, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Now, how many of you all know that having peace with God does not necessarily translate to having peace with people, right? Right? So, the word suffering that is written here in Romans 5 it can be translated as tribulation, suffering, tribulation. And it carries this element of pressure, right? So there, there's this pressure. So you may be suffering from actual persecution, tribulation, or what you're suffering from may, may just be the pressure of the world and the pressure that's all around you. That's what this word is referring to. Think of the pressure that you may be under right now. Are you out of work? and you're running out of money? Are you at work, and you're running out of sanity? Are you feeling the pressure of the extra heavy workload that you're having to bear during this time? How about your marriage? How is it doing? Is it hanging on by a thread? For those of you who are dating, is your boyfriend putting pressure on you for sex before the wedding? I mean, the proper order for all married relationships are dating, engagement, marriage, then children. Too many today are having children before the marriage, and it's making your life so painful, so difficult. Of course, you love that child more than life itself, but because you get things out of order, you don't experience the blessing that God has planned for you. Marriage is tough enough when you do it the right way. It becomes next to impossible when you get it out of order. The proper order, dating, engagement, marriage, children. Are you feeling pressure to get things out of order? Teenagers, are you feeling the pressure of loneliness? Teenagers, I just want you to know, man, I've been thinking about you all so very much. You're on my heart all the time. Uh, most of you know that I worked with teenagers for 25 years. The first 25 years I was a pastor, I worked with teenagers. And I love teenagers. If you're, if you're a teenager, a young adult, you know, in your 20s, uh, I just want you to know, man, I, I love you so much. Um, I think about you guys all the time. And here at Woodlands, um, you know, we're going to... Uh, be, we've been working hard behind the scenes, and hopefully sometime in the first of the year, we're going to be able to reach out to all of you teenagers, and we're going to be able to um, uh, organize some things to help get you guys back together uh, a, a little bit, um, even, in, even in spite of uh, the coronavirus. We think there's some things we can do to get you all together that would be very safe and that would allow you just to see each other a little bit. Um, we love you. We're working on that. We want it to happen. And uh, so pray for us, all right? Parents, teenagers, man, I know you guys are struggling with loneliness. 
Okay, there's so much pressure on all of us in so many ways. But the pressure you are experiencing is literally part of God's preparation work in you to build your character. Now, I know that's one of those preacher phrases, right? That's one of those things you hear and you're like, oh, yeah, preacher, real good for you to say, right? You don't know the pressure I'm under. Well, stay with me because I think you're going to start to understand this. And I think it's going to help you in the pressure you're dealing with. You see, that is good news for those of you who serve Jesus, that the pressure you're dealing with is building your character. You may have thought that your suffering was God's anger coming out in his wrath on you. Many people think that. Many people, when things are going really bad, they think, man, God's angry with me. You know, or <laughs> in those old Lethal Weapon films, remember that? Danny Glover's character was over and over again saying, God hates me. God hates me. Well, no, God doesn't hate you. God loves you. God loves all of his creation. He doesn't want anyone to be his enemy. His word says that. His word says very clearly that he desires for all people to be saved. So for those of you who are Christ followers, those of you who are saved, that the suffering that you're dealing with is not God's wrath on you. He is not mad at you, okay? There's something else going on. There's something else going on. But we have already established, right? <coughs> We've already established that God will never unleash his wrath on those who are saved, right? He will never unleash his wrath for, on those who have been saved from his wrath. He already unleashed his wrath on Jesus on the cross. That penalty has already been paid. So to punish you for your sins would be unjust because the punishment has already been served. Because God is perfect and God is holy, God is never unjust. So your suffering, your affliction, the pressure you're under must have some other purpose. And that purpose we see right here in verse 3. Suffering produces endurance. Now sometimes... Uh, that's called fortitude. That can be trans. Most translations translate the word endurance. Some translate it fortitude. Angela Duckworth, brilliant psychologist, highly awarded um, uh, in, in this nation, has written a book called Grit. Just four letters: G R I T. Grit. And it, I love this book. And, and she studied what it takes to make people successful. What does it take to make people successful? And the basic discussion in the book revolves around talent versus fortitude, or our word endurance, and she calls it grit. And here's what she did, just one example from this book. She studied the cadets at West Point. Now, that's a pretty high level, pretty high caliber group of people to study. And each year, here's what happens. Every year uh, when high schoolers are in their junior year, 14,000 applicants begin the admission process to West Point. Out of those 14,000, only 4,000 will succeed in being nominated to the academy. Only 2,500 of those 4,000 will meet West Point's rigorous academic and physical standard from that select group. Only 1,200 will actually be admitted and enrolled. It is in incredibly competitive to get into West Point. Angela Duckworth, she notes that nearly all of the men and women who come to West Point, that they were all, that they, almost all of them were varsity athletes. And even then, not just varsity athletes, most of them were the captains of their team. And yet she tells us that one in five, one in five of these cadets who go through the rigorous process and are actually admitted to West Point will drop out before graduation. More remarkable is that historically, get this, a substantial number of dropouts leave in the very first summer during an intensive seven-week training program named Beast Barracks or just beast, as it is referred to. I mean, really, she writes, who spends two years trying to get into this prestigious academy and then drops out in the first two months? Who does that? 
beast is described in the West Point Handbook for New Cadets as, quote, the most physically and emotionally demanding part of your four years at West Point. It goes on and says, designed to help make that help you make the transition from new cadet to soldier. So every student was evaluated that gets into West Point through West Point's whole candidate score, all right? And it included a weighted average of their SAT scores and their ACT scores, right? Their high school rank adjusted for the number of students in the applicant's uh, graduating class expert appraisals or leadership potential and performance on objective measures of physical fitness, right? I mean, this is intense, right? Even the words are hard to say. Think of a whole candidate scale as West Point's best guess as to how much talent applicants have for the diverse rigors of this four-year program. So that's what they do. They got to get through this whole candidate um, uh, score and that's going to determine how much talent you have, which is supposed to predict your, your success level. In other words, it's an estimate of how easily cadets will master the many skills required to be a military leader. The whole candidate score is the single most important factor in West Point admissions. And yet, Duckwor Duckworth in her work has found out it did not reliably predict who would make it through BEAST. In fact, this is crazy, listen to this. Cadets with the highest whole candidate scores, the highest ones, were just as likely to drop out as those with the lowest scores. So it isn't just athleticism. It isn't just your IQ, your intelligence, how smart you are. It's not just your EQ, your emotional intelligence, your social intelligence or your leadership qualities alone that predict who will succeed, even though they are important to a certain degree. After testing her theories in other fields of studies, Angela Duckworth looked at athletics, business, art, journalism, academia, and law. Duckworth noted this, here you go, all right, if you dozed off or dreamed off as I was going through some of those details. Come back in, here's the summary. There emerged certain commonalities and they were what interested her most because no matter the field, the most successful people were lucky and talented, no question about it. There was some luck and there was some talent involved, but the story of success did not end there. Many of the people I talked to, she says, could also recount tales of rising stars who to everyone's surprise dropped out or they lost interest before they could realize their potential. Some people, uh, she quoted one person, some people are great when things are going well, but they fall apart when things aren't. Now measure yourself by this. Ask yourself about this. Her conclusion, here you go. The highly successful were paragons of perseverance. The word paragon simply means um, an extreme or a perfect example, if you will, a paragon of perseverance. This is what Angela Duckworth calls grit. And this is what Paul calls hupomone in the Greek, endurance steadfastness, perseverance. In Romans 5.3, it's often translated along those words. It's actually in the key, old King James translated long-suffering, and I like that word. But hupomone means more than endurance. Check this out. This word carries the meaning of the spirit which can overcome the world. It means the spirit which does not passively endure, but which actively overcomes the trials and the tribulations of life. If you have hupomone, you have the spirit, the will, the desire, the grit to overcome whatever gets in your way. This is one of the unique qualities, my friends, of Christianity. We as Christ followers are literally... Are, to, are, are literally to rejoice 
to rejoice in the middle of suffering rather than sigh and uh, submit to it as, oh, man, is this, is this ever going to get over? Oh, my life is so miserable. Oh, I just hate, I just hate life right now. I just, oh, I just, you know, no, that's not, that is not the spirit of the Christ follower. Paul continues, he says that grit, okay, or endurance, that it produces character. Now, the word for character, it's used of metal, which has been purged with fire, so that everything corrupt has been purged out of it. That's what your character is. It's gone through the fire, and all the impurities get, get cleansed out of it. Think of silver that is melted and purified and made into coins and jewelry. Character is only developed by being examined and finding evidence of value. As you go through the suffering, you are being examined. You are being tested. You are being tried. And how you respond to that, the hoop of Monet that you have, the endurance, the grit to carry you through it is the very thing that will chisel out your character. You will come out of the battle stronger. You will come out of the battle purer, better, and nearer to God. All of the character you develop going through the fire of suffering, here's the good news. It doesn't stay here on earth. It goes with you into heaven. The character you develop here actually carries with you into the heavenly kingdom. Why? Because your character... What you become on this earth is a testimony, not to you, but to God who is at work in you. And because it is God's work, it goes with you into the heavenly kingdom. So then Paul says, character produces hope. Now hope, that is the confidence that by integrating God's redemptive acts in the past with a trusting human response. Okay, big words. Let me just help you out with that. Hope is this confidence that as we integrate, as we put together in our mind the fact that God has been trustworthy in the past, right? We see it all through Scripture. God comes through. God comes through. God comes through. I've seen it in my life. And those of you who are followers of Jesus and you've followed Jesus for a number of years, you have seen it in your life as well. God always comes through. His redemptive acts, remember redemption is, comes from the word redeem, which means to rescue and to restore to original value. And that's what God does through his redemptive acts. He rescues us from what our sin gets us into or what someone else's sin gets us into. And he restores us by forgiving us, cleansing us, and, and making us pure and whole again. Right? When you combine a trust in that kind of a God with, with a, this human response in the present right now, the faithful, those who believe in Jesus, those who follow him, will experience the fullness of God's goodness, both in the present and in the future. And so our hope in God, our positive focus on him, and I'm not just talking about a positive mental attitude, because that's very much based on circumstances. I'm not just talking about how your attitude determines your altitude, although that does play a role. I am talking about a hope that comes from trusting a God who has proven to be faithful throughout the ages and throughout your life, and you can trust in him that just as he has come through before, he will come through again. That is the hope of the Christ follower. Biblical faith rests on the trustworthiness that God keeps his promises. The hope is not subjective, but rather it is objective. Because the same God who called Moses is the same God who sent Jesus to earth. The same God who drove Martin Luther in 1517 to nail his 95-point thesis on the Wittenberg door and begin the Reformation to reform the church against the corruption of the church of that day. 
He is the same God who almost 500 years later, he chose the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was named in honor of the great reformer Martin Luther. And he chose him to lead the civil rights movement with his eloquence and with his courage, which he even gave his life for. That same God calls out to you and he calls out to me today to take up our cross and to follow him as we put our hope in him. And that is what he has for us now. So I'm going to hold on right there. I'm going to wrap it up with that. You may have noticed I only gave you three benefits of justification by faith. I want you to watch this week on Facebook, on the Woodlands homepage, I'm going to give you the fourth point this week on Wednesday. I think you've got enough to try to process as it is. So as we wrap this up, what I want you to do, something you can work on this week. As I said, the, meaning, the message, this message is the purpose for hope. And so our purpose for hope, the hope that we can have confidence in, the purpose is Jesus. The purpose of our hope is to point us to Jesus. The purpose of our hope is to stretch and strengthen our faith in Jesus. The purpose of our hope is to develop our character so we become more Christ-like. The purpose of our hope is to prepare and ready ourselves for the kingdom of God. So this week, when you're under pressure, I want you to practice rejoicing. I want you to rejoice right there. And it will be simply an act of discipline initially. You're just going to make yourself do it. But as you do, your character will begin to develop you will become a stronger person mentally, even physically, emotionally, spiritually. And over time, the pressure that used to get you down, that used to leave you hopeless, that used to make you feel like you wanted to give up, will become simply a blip on a screen as you move on to be able to face greater challenges because you rejoice in the hope that we have in our God who is trustworthy and true. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you have proven faithful throughout the generations. God, you have been faithful since the very beginning of time. And, Lord, your faithfulness has been passed on through this present day. And your faithfulness will carry on past us, Lord. Lord, you've given us this unique privilege to trust in your faithfulness. You've given us this unique privilege to, to hope in you. A hope that will not disappoint us. A hope that will not allow us to be put to shame when people mock us. A hope that we know, whether it's in this life or whether it's yet to come, will be completely fulfilled when we have the privilege of being introduced to you by your son Jesus, our Savior, our best friend. And what a joyous day that will be. So, Lord, whatever happens now, we can rejoice. We can have joy. Because everything that's happening is simply getting us ready to meet you. In Jesus' name.